Hello and welcome. My name is Victor Gijsbers and I teach philosophy at Leiden University in the Netherlands. In this video, I want to take a look at the article Echo Chambers and Epistemic Bubbles by Thien Nguyen. In this article, Thien Nguyen is going to make a distinction, a very important distinction, uh, according to the argument of the article, between, on the one hand, epistemic bubbles, which are relatively benign um, epistemic phenomena. They're not good, but they're not like major problems, or they don't need to be major problems. And on the other hand, echo chambers, which according to Thien Nguyen's definitions and, uh, uh, definitions and analyses, are much more pernicious. Right? They're a much bigger problem um, if they exist, and we have very good reasons to believe that they do exist. So the overall structure of the article is this. Thien Nguyen is going to define epistemic bubbles and then define echo chambers and tell us something about how they, how they function. Um, and then the rest of the article is going to focus mostly on echo chambers because that's the sort of real epistemic problem. And there's going to be a part of the article where Thien Nguyen argues that echo chambers can explain certain phenomena that people tend to call post-truth. Uh, and then in the final part of the article, Thien Nguyen is going to talk about how to how to solve the problem of echo chambers, whether it's possible for people to escape from echo chambers, and if so, um, what that kind of escape would look like. All right, so we are going to follow that structure too. Right? We're gonna look at a definition of an epistemic bubble. We're gonna look at the definition of an echo chamber. We're gonna talk a little bit about those, and then we will you know, delve into this idea of echo chambers and how they relate on the one hand to post-truth phenomena, and on the other hand, um, to, to possible escape routes from those echo chambers. So here is Thi Nguyen's definition of an epistemic bubble. It is a social epistemic structure which has inadequate coverage through a process of exclusion by omission. Okay, let me say that again and then we will delve into it. An epistemic bubble is a social epistemic structure so it's, it's something in the social world having to do with how we gain knowledge. It's a social epistemic, epistemic structure which has inadequate coverage through a process of exclusion by omission. Okay, coverage is a very important word here. And for instance, in the literature on fake news, people often distinguish between, on the one hand, problems that have to do with content, and on the other hand, problems that have to do with coverage. And so problems that have to do with content are, for instance, if the information you get is, is false, right? If it's false or misleading, that will be a problem with the content. But it's also possible for you to, for instance, have a new source or some other source of information, which gives you true or mostly true, you know, roughly adequate um, uh, truths, but very selectively in a way that you know you don't get all the information that you ideally would get, maybe you don't get all the information that you need, maybe the selection is even such that the information that you get is very misleading, right? So for instance, here's just an example. Um, suppose that I follow a left-wing blog that gives me true positive news stories about left-wing politicians and true negative news stories about right-wing politicians, but never the other way around. Right? And so I might end up believing that all left-wing politicians are saints and all right-wing politicians are devils, um, even though nobody has ever taught me any untruths. Right? So that would be a problem with coverage. All right, so an epistemic bubble is a social epistemic structure which has inadequate coverage. I don't get the information I need. Maybe I even get a misleading selection of information through a process of exclusion by omission. So exclusion by omission means that certain voices are not heard, certain sources are not encountered because they're just omitted, right? They're not, they don't enter into, into my bubble. That's what makes it a bubble. So how do we get into, into an epistemic bubble? Well, you know, usually I get a lot of my information, for instance, through friends networks, like the people I like, the people I interact with a lot. They also tell me about what's going on in the world. Um, and I might not have selected my friends like in, in order to get a, a, a good access to information in the world, right? I, I select my friends because I like them, because they're interested in the same things, maybe even because they have the same opinions or moral beliefs or political beliefs or something like that. And so the group of people from whom I get information uh, about the world is very badly chosen 
if the purpose were to get good coverage, right? Because I chose them not to get good coverage, but for completely different reasons. So that's one way I could get into an epistemic bubble. Um, here's the second reason that uh, that Thi Nguyen uh, talks about in the in the paper. It's um, it's algorithmic filtering, algorithmic personal filtering, right? Where Google or, or Twitter or Facebook or whatever website I might be using to get information and news uh, decides based on some algorithm that, you know, focuses me on, on me and what I'm supposed to like or want or something like that. Um, it gives me only the kind of news that, um, that I already agree with maybe, or that is going to elicit a certain kind of reaction from me. Uh, anyway, there could be a problem problem of coverage, something that I'm not even really aware of because I have no idea how that algorithm works, for instance. Okay, so that's also a way to get into an epistemic bubble. Um, this is something that Thi Nguyen doesn't say, but it seems to me that you know we're we're in a sense always in an epistemic bubble just by you know living in a certain country, belonging to a certain culture, and so on and so forth, right? I mean. I live in the Netherlands, like Dutch issues loom really large in the news, in what I hear. Um, if you ask me, well, okay, and so what exactly is, is going on right now in, oh, you know, some countries I hear something about, like maybe Belgium because it's very close, or the United States of America because that just happens, you know, news media tend to have a big interest in the United States of America. But I don't hear a lot about what's happening in, in Nigeria, maybe, or Argentina, or, you know, so many countries in the world about which I am relatively ignorant. Um, and also, maybe I don't follow a lot of people on social media, for instance, who, who come from those countries. Uh, again, I have a lot of people from sort of neighboring countries and from the United States of America. So um, that's a bubble too, right? I would say that that's, you know, I don't get like the kind of world news coverage that maybe would be ideal if I wanted to have a good grasp of what's going on in the world, what people are sort of really dealing with and so on and so forth. Okay, so these problems of coverage can on the one hand mean that I'm just missing out on certain information. It can also through a process that Thi Nguyen calls bootstrap corroboration um, give me give me wrong epistemic ideas, right? It can give me wrong ideas about what's true and, and the reliability of my own beliefs. A bootstrapped confirmation, a corroboration. The idea of bootstrapping, it's from the uh, tales of the Baron of Munchausen. It's the idea that you can sort of pull yourself out of a swamp by pulling on your bootstraps, right? So there's really no, no solid basis. You're just sort of pulling yourself up into the air. And the idea of bootstrapped corroboration would be that, oh, you know, I believe something because I hear a lot of people around me saying it, and then I say it too, and the people around me think, ah, well, you know, Victor is saying it too, must be true. And so we're sort of all strengthening our beliefs, even though there's, there's not much basis for that in reality. Okay, so epistemic bubbles, we can see how they come into existence. We can see that they can be epistemically problematic, but Thi Nguyen says, they're kind of fragile, right? As soon as I'm confronted with other people who are not in this bubble and they give me this information that I'm lacking, the bubble pops, right? I get this information that I'm lacking. Okay, it's relatively easy, right? If today I decide that I really want to know more about what's going on in Nigeria, uh, I, can, I can read up on that, right? I mean, there's even an English language newspaper, I believe, or probably many. Um, I can, I can, I can, I can get that information. It's, it's in a sense easy. So I could just run into the information or could search it out relatively easily. These bubbles, they might be a problem, but they're not like a terrible problem. It's not, they're not very resilient. Well, that's very different for echo chambers. And that's why most of the article is about echo chambers. So what's the point of echo chambers? Well, echo chambers are sort of social structures that sort of lock you in, right? If you're in the echo chamber, you start believing, like it's part of being in the echo chamber that you start believing that any information coming from inside the echo chamber is good and reliable, and any information coming from outside the echo chamber is bad and unreliable. 
So here's the definition that Thien Nguyen gives of, a, of an echo chamber. It's a pretty long definition, so I'll, I'll talk about each of the parts of the definition as we go through it. Okay, so the first part of the definition, definition is this. An echo chamber is an epistemic community which creates a significant disparity in trust. That's important, a disparity in trust between members and non-members. So an echo chamber is a social structure where if I'm in it, I have high trust in other members of the echo chamber and low trust in members, uh, in non-members, in people outside of the echo chamber. So it's an epistemic community which creates a significant disparity in trust between the in-group and the out-group. By, this is the second part of the definition, by excluding non-members through epistemic discrediting. So the echo chamber functions in such a way that people who don't belong to it are discredited, right? What we tell each other maybe, or what the authority figure in the echo chamber tells me and what the echo chamber serves to reinforce is the idea that these outside sources, they're unreliable, you can't trust them, right? They're, they're, there's epistemic discrediting going on. I'm actively being told not to trust those people outside. So an echo chamber, like I might be part of some, um, you know, listening to some, some, some like very politically motivated news channel and all the time they tell me, don't believe the mainstream media. They are corrupt, they're lying to you. That would be this, that's excluding non-members through epistemic discrediting. Third part of the definition, and amplifying members' epistemic credentials. So that's the other side. You discredit the people outside of the echo chamber. Uh, you give extra credit to people inside the echo chamber. Like we are the warriors for truth uh, who stand opposed to the lying liberal mainstream media, right? That would be one way, uh, one kind of echo chamber, you know, engages in that kind of uh, discourse a lot. Number four, fourth part of the definition that uh, this is about what it takes to be a member. General agreement with core beliefs is a prerequisite for membership, including beliefs that support the disparity in trust, right? So you're only really accepted as a member if you believe certain core tenets. Uh, usually there are core tenets that have to do with, you know, whatever this echo chamber is about. Maybe it's an echo chamber about right-wing politics. Maybe it's an echo chamber about climate science denial, maybe, maybe it's an echo chamber about, um, oh, I don't know, uh, a certain diet being the greatest, best diet in the world. I mean, it doesn't have to be political. Um, so general agreement with core beliefs is a prerequisite for membership. I mean, I have to believe that that diet is like the real thing, the only healthy thing for your body, um, including beliefs that support the disparity in trust, right? So it only becomes a real echo chamber if to be a member, I have to I have to sign on. Well, not literally, but I have to sort of sign on to this idea that I can only trust the in group, right? And that the out group, I mean, that's the um, that's the mainstream food establishment trying to cast doubts on my raw vegetables only diet. Uh, you know, that's that's sort of part of of being in the echo chamber. So it's not just about believing something; it's about believing that you are a member of a special in-group who know the truth and who have to defend themselves against this hostile outside world that's trying to sort of um, lead you into a falsehood. Okay, echo chambers. So echo, I mean, there can be political echo chambers. There can be echo chambers about diets or sports regimes or, or ways of parenting. And there can be religious uh, uh, echo chambers, I would say quite obviously, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay. Here's one special feature that's not part of the definition, but kind of important for uh, Thien Nguyen's overall story. It's what he calls a disagreement reinforcement mechanism. And um, that's not the most, you know, maybe obvious term, a disagreement reinforcement mechanism. But what is, what is I think, quite clear is the way that, is what he means and, and the way that it works. So the idea is that most echo chambers have this sort of mechanism where hearing people disagree with the echo chamber, with what the, the, the core beliefs of the echo chamber are, actually serves to strengthen members' beliefs in them, right? So suppose that I'm part of this sort of echo chamber that always rails against the mainstream media. 
And so now I watch the mainstream media and they, they tell a completely different story, right? A completely different story from what I hear in my echo chamber. Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to think, oh, whoa, wait a second. Maybe, maybe my echo chamber is wrong, right? Maybe my beliefs are wrong. No, of course not, right? Because I've been told, I mean, it's part of what I believe, that the mainstream media are always lying. And so the fact that they disagree with me actually strengthens my conviction. Right? And so this is, we can here already see why echo chambers are really hard to escape from. Um, if you encounter people who disagree with you and you're just in an epistemic bubble, that sort of pops the bubble. But if you are in an echo chamber and you meet people who disagree with you, whoa, that actually strengthens this we versus them, right? This us versus them, this trust versus untrustworthiness uh, narrative. And so it might actually strengthen your beliefs. Right? Disagreement might actually strengthen your own beliefs and make you exclude other people all the more. Okay, so those are the definitions, the analysis, and now in the uh, final two parts of the paper, Thien Nguyen is going to talk about, uh, well, first, how echo chambers allow us to understand like certain phenomena that people have called post-truth. And Thien Nguyen is going to claim that using like this, this theory of echo chambers, actually gives you a much more natural um, a much more natural explanation of certain things that are going on than the explanations that are often given. So here is something you might might believe about your own society that there's a pretty large group of people who just just deny the facts right I mean there are overwhelm there's overwhelming evidence for one thing or another maybe there's overwhelming evidence for climate man-made climate change or there's overwhelming evidence that um, Oh, I don't know. Certain elections were were you know um, legitimate or illegitimate, or you know it can depend on, on on the country and so on and so forth. So it seems to you that certain groups in society are just they just deny the plain facts. So here's one explanation: it's to say, look, we have entered a sort of post-truth society where a lot of people are completely irrational, right? They don't care about truth anymore. They're completely irrational. Well, that's pretty disconcerting. But it's also, it's also kind of unlikely, right? I mean, are there really so many people who don't believe in truth? Like, I mean, do they really just, are they totally irrational? Do they just say whatever they like? Then why does it sound like they are making claims, giving arguments and so on and so forth? Um, it's a, it's, it's, maybe it's a right explanation, but it's, it's not obviously the right explanation. Okay, so here's what Thien Nguyen says. He says, no, look, we can explain this with echo chambers, right? I mean, once people have entered an echo chamber, an echo chamber that tells them that the election was stolen from them or an echo chamber that tells them that climate change is unreal or something like that. Well, then even being epistemically virtuous, like caring about truth, I mean, given that you trust the people inside and that you don't trust the people outside, you know, it's actually, it actually makes epistemic sense to only believe the people inside and not believe the people outside. So if you really are sort of caught up in an anti-climate change echo chamber, then you actually seem to have good reasons, right? Even if you are sort of motivated by pursuing the truth, you might believe, well, I shouldn't believe the mainstream media. I shouldn't believe the scientists. I should believe what I hear on on this Reddit group or that Facebook group, or, you know, that, that might be the way that you yourself have actually sort of learned to understand epistemic space. Um, and so Thien Nguyen says, you know, if that's what's going on, then we don't need to ascribe to those people like brute irrationality or, or they don't care for truth or something like that. No, the problem is they've been caught up in an echo chamber, which colors how they think about truth and where they think they can find truth. And that is also very relevant if we want to understand what we can do with those people. Because just giving them the evidence, it ain't gonna work, right? You can't just say, well, here's the evidence, right? It's from the scientific journals, just read it. Because, you know, those people don't trust the scientific journals. And that means th this is not gonna do anything, right? You can give them the evidence, but if they don't trust it, it's not gonna change their mind. So what we know, I mean, if this is right, um, if what's going on here are echo chambers, then we know that increased exposure to the facts or the truth or something like that ain't gonna work. That's not really gonna help us at all. Um, 
Okay, so that brings us to the final part of the uh, of the article. Well, what if people are trapped in echo chambers, right? I mean, is it their own fault? Um, can they escape? How can they escape? What can we do to help them escape? You know, those are those are serious practical questions. So, on the first thing, is it their own fault? Uh, Thien Yuan says, you know, it could be. It could be their own fault. I mean, if you decide to only listen to one source of news because you like it and it fits your political beliefs and you you believe it sort of uncritically until you're sort of been sucked into the echo chamber, then you made some mistakes, right? You made some epistemic mistakes. Um, but even if you stop making epistemic mistakes now, it's hard to see how to how to get out. And it doesn't have to be that way, right? It doesn't have to be your own fault. I mean, you could be sort of born into an echo chamber, grow up in an echo chamber. So we don't necessarily need to blame people for being in an echo chamber. So how do we, how, how could you get out? Well, we've already seen it's going to be really hard, right? Just engaging with the evidence isn't going to do it because you have no reason to trust the evidence. So really what you need in order to get out of an echo chamber is you need something that um, Thien Nguyen calls a reboot, right? You sort of need to, to throw away your old beliefs and start acquiring them anew. And he likens this to Descartes' procedure in the meditations, where Descartes says it's pretty much an anti-echo chamber tract in a sense. He says, you know, I have learned so many wrong things since I was young. Let's throw everything out and start from scratch. Well, that's kind of unrealistic. The idea that you, you by yourself, I mean, this is what Descartes want to do, sort of as an individual, start from scratch and get to knowledge. Uh, well, you don't have to do that, Thien Wang says. Uh, you can rely, of course, on other people, but you have to rely on people outside of the echo chamber, right? So what you would have to do is you would have to say, okay, I'm going to throw away all my old beliefs. I'm going to listen to people outside of my echo chamber. Um, I'm going to, you know, maybe not take them completely on trust, but I'm, I'm going to approach them with a base level of trust. And then maybe I can sort of reform my beliefs in a way that is more adequate. But can we expect people to do that? I mean, part of the problem is that once you're inside an echo chamber, it all seems all right, right? It seems like you have the right beliefs and the others have the wrong beliefs. Well, says Thien Yuen, there's really only sort of, well, I don't know whether he says that there's only one possible route of escape, but he, he talks about one plausible route of escape, um, which starts with, um, with gaining the trust of some people, like starting to trust some people outside of your own chamber, right? And that could, could happen maybe in many ways. I mean, if I'm only, if my entire life is spent on this one um, corner of the internet where everybody has this sort of echo chamber set of beliefs, then it's going to be hard to even find anyone uh, who's outside of it. But, you know, probably I meet people in, in daily life in all kinds of circumstances. If some of them gain my trust, right, if they become my friends, maybe, or at least I think of them as, you know, serious people, and it turns out that they don't agree with me about certain of these, these core beliefs of my echo chamber, um, you know, then maybe, maybe slowly, I start becoming a little bit less certain of what's going on. Thien Yuen doesn't say how effective this is, uh, how exactly we have to do this in practice, I mean, he says, you know, this is something that we have to think about a lot more. Um, but I think his core idea here is pretty plausible. It's what I would call the trust first idea. Right? I mean, you can't, you can't come with the truth or the facts or the evidence or something like that. You've got to have trust in people first. You've got to get people to trust you first. Um, and only once there is sort of a baseline of human communication and people assume that at least what you say is said in good faith and so on and so forth, right? Only then can you sort of really get into the content and maybe change people's minds. So overall, I think uh, Thien Wang's distinction between epistemic bubbles and echo chambers is very useful. Uh, and I think the analysis of echo chambers, like the role that they play in, in post-truth phenomena and this idea of the the primacy of trust, as I have called it, uh, I think those are very good points. So um, I hope this was enjoyable and useful to you, and I'll see you in another video. Thanks.